I mean, I have to I have to say it's been a long, hard day and a long, hard week. But as soon as I came into this room, as it were, um, with my colleagues, if I may say so, Hakima, T Tanisha and Mutoni, I felt immediately revived, not not just because of their wonderful presence, but because of what we're going to talk about this evening. It's so rare for me. I'm trying to think how many times I've actually walked into a room literally or metaphorically in which has only been black women who are senior and professional and in leadership roles. So it's an absolute delight to, to be here this evening. And I'm so glad that the conduit has, has helped to bring um, these wonderful women together. Um, having said all of that, it, it, it's still the case, as you can tell from, from what I've just said, that as black women, we are often still marginalized, still kept out of the corridors of power, still um, uh, almost having to go cap in hand, as it were, to get support and recognition. And, and yet at the same time, I wouldn't want to give a totally gloomy um, outlook on our situation. And certainly over the years, it, it's been my experience over the, so past several decades that um, although um, in many respects we've remained on, on, on the edges, there's still a, a, there's been a very strong sense that it's sort of black women time now to use that expression. And certainly that the idea of feminism in all its various diverse forms is something in which we should not only be participating but crafting and making into something we can call our own that fulfills our needs as well as um, wider um, groups. So all of that is, is great. And yet, of course, there are these um, difficult um, uh, facts that we have to face around black women's health, around particularly around childbirth. We've recently had some very um, worrying statistics released in this country about the likelihood of women, black women losing their children and, and suffering ill health during pregnancy and, and beyond. Um, of course, the pandemic has hit women probably that bit harder than men anyway. But on top of that, the economics of our situation currently is that um, black and, and minority ethnic women in this country have been hit hardest of all in terms of the jobs that have been lost and, and um, uh, the circumstances under which they live. The, I, uh, the experience of, of domestic violence would be another part of that picture. And yet, as I keep saying, you know, we, we, we're not, we might be down at times, but we're never defeated. And I think that's really important to hold on to that strength. And especially, I think, of all the wonderful writers and artists and sportswomen and other um, uh, black women who've really stood up and said, this is us, this is what we do, this is what we're thinking, this is what we want to do. And with that kind of leadership, I feel quite confident that we will continue to make huge strides and demonstrate to the world that there's a different way of doing things, different way of going about our business. So with all that, I'm very much looking forward to having this discussion and to find out more about the Black Feminist Fund. That in itself is, is such a resonant phrase. So I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome two co-founders of the Black Feminist Fund, Hakima Abbas and Tanisha McHarris, and also Matoni Muriu, who's the Senior Advisor on Diversity, Inclusion and Shared Leadership at UN Women. I'm gonna um, start with um, uh, some questions that I've got, and then hopefully we'll have some questions in from uh, you who are listening in uh, to contribute. Um, as well. But, but let me start by asking Hakima, if I may, and do please um, say a little bit about, bit more about yourself when, when, when you address this question, Hakima. Please um, tell us a bit about um, Black feminist and women's rights movements globally. What's your view of where we are at the moment? What are some of the issues and the challenges that Black women are facing, continue to face, have faced, and specifically in relation to under-resourcing. So quite a big questionnaire to open up the discussion. Happy to, thank you so much. Um, as you said, I'm Hakima Abbas. I'm based in West Africa and I'm one of the co-founders of the Black Feminist Fund. Um, so 
Hello there, as you said in your intro remarks, Black feminist movements are really at the helm of social change globally, not just on issues that we traditionally understand as women's rights issues, but also in the climate movement, in the youth movements, in movements for democratic change and against state violence. If you think, for example, about the mobilizations that toppled the al-Bashir regime in Sudan, we know that that kind of level of mobilization doesn't just happen overnight. It's years of continuous struggle, years also of facing repression and risk and attacks, but to keep up that resistance. And when you saw those mobilizations, it was clear that a woman's place is in the revolution. Even much of the iconography around the movement was around women's participation. And Sudan isn't an isolated incident. Um, you can think of the NSARS protests in Nigeria or the movement against the rising fascisms in Brazil or for peace in Colombia. Black women and non-binary people are necessary leaders in these movements. And you asked about some of the challenges that we face, that that leadership comes with many risks still. So women and non-binary people are targeted not only on the basis of their race as black women, but also their gender and sexuality and other identities. If you take, for example, Marielle Franco from Brazil, who was a black lesbian woman activist and elected councilwoman who was murdered. Um, we know also Miriam Mirinda of the Garifuna and a land defender in Honduras who's constantly under attack for the work that she does. Um, black women also face the challenge, as, as you were talking about, Lola, not being seen as leaders, not being trusted and respected and supported as leaders because of the impacts of white supremacy and patriarchy. And that shows up in resourcing as well. Despite being trailblazers in the fight for justice in every major social movement, funders don't drive large-scale funds to Black-led women, women, girl, trans, and non-binary people's organizing. And to give you a scale of some of that under-resourcing, we've been doing some digging into funders' um, data with the Human Rights Funders Network as the Black Feminist Fund. And we saw that Black feminist movements receive somewhere between 0.1 and 0.35% of annual grant monies from foundations. I mean, so literally 99.9% .9 of grant funds do not go to black women, girls, and trans people. Um, so given what we know about the impact and the potential of black feminist movements, that figure is really both outrageous and shameful. Thank you. Yes, it, 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 the scale, that's quite a shocking statistic, isn't it? And um, I mean, I, I wouldn't have thought it was a huge amount, but I certainly would have thought we might have gotten above two or three percent. So that, that, that is quite shocking. So perhaps um, uh, I'm, go I'm going to ask um, uh, Tanisha the same question. So, uh, or a similar question. So, and that's about the, the, the point at which the idea of the Black Feminist Fund gained real traction? What was it that, that, that sparked it off? But I'd also like to know how the two of you came to the decision that this was the, 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 um, the method you were going to use to, to raise the profile of and, and get resources into black women's organizations. Thank you, it's actually one of my favorite questions. Um, so we, we, we always say that even be, before the vehicle was started, that we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors and of movements who've come before. So just to name that we call ourselves the Black Feminist Fun and Black Feminism, um, we just stand on long legacy and generations of folks who not just fought so that we can be here, but also created frameworks and visions and ideas for how we might actually transform the world so Black women can thrive. So we honor them. Um, but in terms of how the vehicle was started, it was actually at where many important things get settled or decided or dreamt up at a kitchen table in 2013. Um, Hakima and I uh, were sitting at the table discussing um, the painful challenges of moving resources to Black women's work 
In fact, the two of us were part of social justice efforts, different social justice efforts, although linked and, and shared struggle in different places around the world, but the same challenge around moving money and how, how painful it was and how hard it was. So we, said it, we decided to turn a venting session into a dreaming session because that's what Black women do. Um, and we started to dream up what would it look like to have a vehicle that, one, moved resources boldly and unapologetically to Black women-led work, but also did it while acknowledging the inherent value of Black women. So it wasn't just even how much resources would move and the boldness of those resources, but the care and the connection and the spirit and how it would move. And so that is how it was dreamt up back in 2013. It's been 10 years of, of dreaming for us. Um, and, you know, as Hakima mentioned earlier, around less than 1% of resources going to Black women globally, it was in that moment where we acknowledged, you know, our, our, our tagline is fun Black feminists like you want them to win. And currently, if we look at how we're resourcing Black feminist movements, we are resourcing them like we want them to lose. And so the only way for us to really um, intervene was to intervene. And so the Black Feminist Fund was this idea um, that emerged from the conversation. And over the past 10 years, we've had amazing conversation with Black women and non-binary folks from around the world that contributed to that dream. And we just said, we can change that because we're powerful and we can dream up this work together. And so with our allies and in community, um, we're, we said now is the time. We believe we're in a moment. We're at the crossroads in so many different parts of our lives and parts of the world. And Black feminists can tilt us towards the right direction. So although we've been dreaming this for 10 years, uh, this year was the time to launch. So, so the dream becomes reality. Actually, before I come back to Hakima, I would like to go to Matoni because I'm wondering, you know, how does all of that uh, resonate with you? And if you could fold that into this question of why you think that black women and feminist issues are central to international issues and, um, and why they should be part of the UN's women's uh, agenda. Thank you, Lola. Um, and uh, let me begin by conveying the sincere apologies of our uh, Assistant Under Secretary General, Executive Director of UN Women, Dr. Pumzile Mlangunguka, uh, who is a passionate champion for this fund. Uh, we at UN Women know all about the fund and uh, cannot be here this evening uh, because of various uh, circumstances that, that were completely beyond her, beyond her control. Um, so the reference for uh, a lot of our work as UN Women are the Sustainable Development Goals, which were adopted in 2015 by member states uh, from all over the world with the goal of leaving no one behind. And uh, within the, the Sustainable Development Goals, Goal 5, is specifically about achieving gender equality and women's uh, empowerment uh, worldwide, uh, globally. And uh, we're very aware that we will not be able to achieve these goals by 2030, which is the target date, if we don't center the specific circumstances of black women and girls. And um, <clears throat> the ERED has highlighted this as part of a recently concluded uh, general generation equality forum held in Paris, um, which was which was an effort to um, to to emphasize this issue of investment and uh, funding of uh, of of development issues and of uh, groups uh, that are working on gender issues and for us specifically. Of, of black women, uh, black women feminists. And so the challenge was that for all countries to increase their uh, investments and commitments to achieve uh, SDG five. And when we think about the global implications of events uh, like the pandemic that hit us last year, uh, as UN women, we take note of the fact that just this year in 2021, around 435 million women and girls will be living on less than $2 a day. 
So 47 million of those were pushed into poverty because of COVID-19. The majority of those 47 million are mostly black indigenous people of color. So yes, we continue to center black women uh, in the global project of ending poverty, discrimination, and achieving gender equity. And we see time and time again that black feminists play, play a key role in leading grassroots efforts to upend systemic oppression across the world. But they have, as, as we've heard, uh, the hardest time in raising funds to make their work sustainable. This is why the fund is, is so important. Oh. You're muted, I think, Baroness. Gosh, you, you, you'd think I'd know by now. I've been doing this for 18 months. Um, I'd be interested to know from all of you, um, each in your different ways, uh, this word feminist, okay, because I don't know about the context within which you're working, but certainly I'm thinking back a bit now to the, I don't know what, 80s, I guess, 70s and 80s, where feminism has always been something of a, an insult uh, to women. A lot of women, particularly black women, I would say, um, were very dubious about what it, what it meant for us. And, and then, then we had that moment of Alice Walker's womanism which was different, meant to signal something that was really quite different to what was perceived as white women's feminism. And, and it, it, I wouldn't say we've come full circle, but, but it, there's almost a sense in which the, the word has been rehabilitated by making it absolutely upfront and literally centre. How, how, did, how, did how did you decide that that was the way to go? And, and this is not only about the Black Feminist Fund, because I've noted um, also that... Um, you know, it comes up in these other contexts, in the context of the UN as well. How, how, did, that, how did that come about? Tanisha, would you like to start? You are asking all my favorite questions. Um, so I, I'll answer, I'll, I'll, I'll share a few reflections and, and specifically why we decided to use the term Black Feminist Fund. I think that the first is, what we, we, we center ourselves is in the framework of black feminism. And so we acknowledge and honor that there is a history of feminist movements and there's been lots of growth, lots of progress, particularly around um, inclusion and bringing an analysis around race and other and colonialism and imperialism, that there's been growth. But we identify as black feminists because we know that that is a particular framework, a particular set of beliefs and ideas that's actually in many ways, it, 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 Black feminism has birthed a lot of the broader feminist movements without getting the credit for it. But Black feminists, when we, when we get down to the soul and the spirit of it, is an analysis around power, an analysis around value. And the first is that we can never talk about patriarchy and sexism without talking about racism uh, and colonialism and the history of imperialism. And in fact, they're in deep relationship with each other. And when we separate them, we actually harm, harm our, our work to fight and end both. And so that particular framework is where we sit and root our work. Um, and we know that came from that Black women foremothers um, who knew that, but often in broader feminist spaces, it wasn't acknowledged and, and understood as that. And then the second, in terms of our, our, the soul of Black feminism um, that we really deeply believe in is the inherent value of Black women. And so the idea, the politic is, it is a political practice. It is an analysis around power, but it holds the value of black women that we are valuable inherently without having to be superheroes, although we have to be in all these spaces and often only get visibilized when we do heroic things. That outside of that, we just as human, as beings are inherently valuable and deserve to be treated as such, our humanity deserves to be recognized. And so that's the black feminist politic. And so the reason why we decided to call ourselves that is because it's the time to be unapologetic around our, our analysis, but also around our value and how we value black women and black non-binary people. And we believe that that term really holds that. That's, that's great. Uh, I'd also like to ask Hakima, uh, her, her take on this as well. And I'm just wondering also about the extent to which um, absolutely, you know, non-apologetic. Um, 
but was there also a little bit of trepidation about how it would be received? And did you encounter things that made you sort of think, oh, wait a minute, is this the right uh, title? Certainly, and people do ask us. People ask us, you know, why not the Black Women's Fund or even why Black? There's also that question, you know, how, how did you come up with that terminology? What do you mean by that? Who's included, who's not? Um, but as Tanisha said, we felt like this was a moment to be unapologetic about who we are and who we are um, working with and working for. Um, and I think I would just add something to, to what Tanisha was saying about what black feminisms bring. And I think that, that there's some, there's a creativity and innovation and there are solutions that are being dreamt up um, at what is called the margins, you know, where, where that innovation is really necessary for people to survive. And that's the creativity and the innovation that this world needs right now. And again, unapologetically, we say that supporting Black feminist movements will mean a catalytic change, not just for Black women, but for everyone. Um, we were just on a, on a webinar that we organized with a black woman farmer from West Africa, from Senegal, who leads a campaign in seven countries in West Africa called We Are the Solution. And that's a bold claim, but they're saying, look, we have the answers to climate change. We have the answers to food scarcity. And as black women farmers, you need to invest in us if you want to change this for the world. And so I think that's the politic that we're putting forward. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I mean, it's so evocative for me, um, you know, in, in this country for quite some time um, in, the, in the 80s, again, going back, um, there was this idea that um, feminism belonged to white women and, and actually black feminism belonged to African-American women. So there was, this, there was this hole called black British feminism. And, you know, um, but, Having said that, I mean, there was a, well, there's collections of essays, so it must have been real, but you know, there, there, there was this sort of sense that of recognizing the diaspora, but also recognizing the specificities of particular situations. And I think that's one of the things that, 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 that we have to grapple with, whatever title we would use, whether it was the Women's Fund or the Fund or, or Black Women's, uh, uh, you know, whatever. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to um, ask you, Matoni, have you, how have you dealt with this? Have, have you had any pushback on this kind of use of that terminology in, in the UN and elsewhere? I think you, you have, um, you've been working with, with Oxfam as well. I mean, to what extent has, have we moved to, to the place where actually to use the term black feminism isn't seen as a scary thing, or do we still have some, some way to go yet? Well, um, first of all, I, I, I will borrow that word unapologetic because it has to be the approach. And um, you and women, uh, because of the reason, our reason that why feminists all over the world fought for the agency to be stood up within the UN system. It was very clear that we were bringing an unapologetic approach to um, equity and justice issues uh, from a, a, an unapologetic gender, uh, gender basis. And so um, talking about fem being feminist, uh, femini you, uh, uh, feminist leadership, feminist approaches uh, is becoming, uh, we, we, we are using that language uh, more and more boldly, not that there's not pushback, including from member states uh, with, with um, you know, as would be expected. So our mission actually uh, makes it uh, gives us cover, so to speak, uh, to uh, use that approach. What has been really important in the recent past is to layer uh, issues of anti-black of, of anti racism 
which run deep and have profound and entrenched effects on the sort of statistics that I just mentioned. And when you do that, you, you see that we have to add racial justice to our gender justice agenda. And this is where um, uh, within, uh, especially within the, the UN system, uh, where this is, uh, this, is a, this is a lift. And um, it's an important one, uh, but it happens at a time when uh, the UN system is talking about racial justice a lot more and uh, beginning to uh, provide uh, references that can give us um, that, that can allow us to move uh, both the agenda of uh, uh, gender equity and, uh, and equality and justice, as well as uh, anti-Black racism in a, very, in a very deliberate way. In fact, uh, the Human Rights Council just released a report on the promotion and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms of Africans and people of African descent against excessive use of force and other human rights violations by law enforcement officers, for example, and pointed out that black women are differently, but particularly impacted by these human rights uh, violations. And so um, because of the nature of why we exist of our reason that we can, we can, we can lead with, um, with uh, the, the feminist, being feminist and feminism as a frame and what we have to, uh, the lift we have now is layering on anti-Black racism uh, as one of the uh, aspects that we, uh, that we include. And this is important because the statistics um, that Tanisha gave, um, uh, or was it Hakim, I can't remember, about how much funding actually how many, how much resource, you know, the level of resources that I invested, the rationale for uh, why women's organizations don't get uh, uh, the funding that's needed to do work on gender justice is there. And then if you layer anti-Black racism on that, then you see why Black women led organizations and Black feminists are getting even less of what is already there. Which is crazy, um, yes. <laughs> because yes. you know, you know that we are the solution is is absolutely right, and that there's a level on which it's kind of tacitly admitted that you have to support women if you want to support communities and families and society and the world at large. But by the same token, there's this kind of grudging attitude. It's it's almost as if it's beyond the imagination that um, we can make that kind of contribution. So for me, I think that part of what you've been talking about for me is around this notion of intersectionality. So those different layers are so important. It's a very powerful concept. I was talking about this earlier today because it enables us to take on, as I think Hakim was saying earlier, we take on colonialism, take on anti-Black racism, you take on racism in general, you take on all of these um, issues around dis disability. I mean, you know, um, some startling statistics I, I heard this afternoon on, on young people who are getting caught up in, in, in running drugs. Um, uh, disproportionate numbers of learning disabled black children being caught up in, in, in running drugs and thinking about the impact on the family, on the mother, um, on the sister, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, there are these, these multi layers, but it's as if it's really novel idea that we could say something about environmental sustainability. <laughs> and and so, so one would hope that we would have a moment of moving on from that and that that moment is now. But I, I do want to ask um, Tanisha um, um, and of course um, uh, 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 Hakima, uh, what, what is the Black Feminist Fund's theory of change? How are you gonna change this problem of under-resourcing? What, what's your methodology and, and how do you think it's going to um, work over a period of time? Um, it's so much connected to what you just named um, is that folks know it, or at least kind of talk about it or around it, our power, our ability to create meaningful change, and yet it's still seen as novel. Sometimes, and then I'll go off my like slight Tanisha tangent and then get to your, your question. 
sometimes I feel like we're caught between being deeply underestimated and folks actually knowing what we can get done if we were resourced well. So I think we're in a particular moment where folks, they vacillate between not trusting our leadership or honoring our power and our genius. And, and in the moments where they actually can see it, they get windows, they get afraid. And I think that's okay. Uh, okay, as in we can bring folks along um, if you want to come along. But I think a, power, a part of the work is the genius and the leadership of Black women, of Black feminists is clear. Um, and if we want to create the kind of meaningful transformation, uh, we have to be able to resource folks who are doing the work, and particularly folks on the margins that Hakima mentioned, that are often deemed as vulnerable or victims instead of powerful and inherently like brilliant enough to be the solution. And so a part of our um, theory of change is one, we know that feminist movements, autonomous feminist movements get things done. Historically, they have always transformed societies, systems and cultures. They're more powerful than political parties. Even often studies show actually the movements can get things done more than what women representatives in government. So we know the power of movements. Then you combine the power of black leadership. Well, I mean, the power of black leadership globally to challenge, transform and change cultures, shift narratives and inspire folks across the world in every pocket to stand up, to do the courageous thing. You combine that, black feminists, at the center of all of that. And so we know what is possible. What's possible is actually a better, more thriving world where there's, that, there's power that can be shared, where we all have enough and have what we need, not just to survive and to thrive, but to live well, to live with dignity. And so because we know that at the spirit of Black feminism is it for the kind of world we want to believe, the only way to resource organizations, activists, leaders, collectives is through long-term core flexible support. So that means moving resources that are not one year, not two years, but the, but the amount of years we know that change happens. And so our goal, our commitment is to try to move grants at up to the point of eight years at least, because that that's what it looks like to fund folks, to believe in folks that are going to be building power and doing that kind of meaningful change over time. So that's our, our hope to resource resource the work. And so that is a part of the reasons why we're raising the resources that we're trying to raise now, not piece by piece. You know, we've been saying unapologetic often because too often we're in spaces, particularly, especially around money, having to apologize for our existence, let alone our work, let alone who we are. We're not doing that anymore. Unapologetically means we need the resources now because we all, we can actually find a movement, movement for the amount of time we know it takes for change to happen. Um, and we wanna raise those resources over the next two years. So we're committed to raising $100 million so that when we partner with organizations, we can partner with them like we believe in their leadership and believe in their work. And so that requires us to, to make partnerships that believe in us like they, want, like they want, like we want us to win. So it's a part of how we're thinking about change not just for the world, but change for our movements and how we're trying to move resources to the work. Yeah, and I think that that time scale is necessary, isn't it? Because the, the world is full of projects that last for one year or 18 months, and then so what? We, we revert to the norm. I'm aware that we've got some, we've actually got a, a couple of questions in, in the Q&A, but before we go on to those, I one of the reasons why I like being associated with the conduit is that, um, a lot of its members are activists actually in one way or another and that things can get done um so you know it's not a question of oh let's have some lovely people along to have a chat and then off we go and, and carry on as we did before so my question to you and i'm going to start with hakima is, is, is and that but i'll ask all of you um what do you think um conduit members can do to support this movement. Um, what, what is, if, if, if I were to say, you know, what's your call to action? Tell us, tell us what it is you want us to do. There's a whole community that belongs to the conduit that are very committed to a set of values that I'm sure you'd find aligned with yours. And, um, you know, tell us, tell us what it is we can do, whether that's, well, I'm not going to tell you what you can tell us. Tell us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, the conduit community can really support us by mobilizing others to give 
by being champions wherever they are of black feminist movements and of the black feminist fund. Um, I know that many of the conduit community are in the UK um, and we know that UK aid has significantly decreased. The philanthropic sector is still in a kind of model that's very charity based and not really supportive of movements in the long term. So I think it's important to influence that um, and to shift some of the trends in the UK away from that model and towards supporting feminist movements and particularly black feminist movements. Um, and we are also really reaching out to your black members, for instance, um, hoping that they can show solidarity. We'd love to have black giving as part of the framework. You know, I think we talked about how the narrative is often of a passive recipient of aid be looking like many of us. And we know that that's not the case. We know that black people um, in terms of philanthropic dollars really give a high amount of their income. Um, so how can we you know, tap into that, work with black philanthropists who are wanting to give to black feminist movements and who see the necessity of those movements in creating change for all of us. Um, but yeah, otherwise join us, mobilize with us, influence with us, be champions with us. That, that's all very clear and great. Matoni, would you like to add to that at all? Is there anything specific you, you'd think that the community can do? Yes, and um, you know, I, I'll, I'll just start by underlining some what Tanisha has just so eloquently said about feminist movements and the fact they, that they are a key factor in creating mm -hmm. lasting change lasting change, uh, and not only on issues that directly affect uh, women and girls, but uh, that affect deep uh, structural changes that can positively transform society. So when we start there, and the fact that Black women are necessary leaders and mobilizing uh, at all levels, including grassroots levels, seeding and driving global change, I think that uh, organizations such as UN Women uh, uh, and philanthropic organizations, the shift that we have to make uh, to working with Black Feminists and the Black Feminist Fund is supporting movements. Because uh, I think that's the shift uh, from working with organizations that are, you know, um, uh, it, that are set up in a certain way to really supporting movements. I see the Black Feminist Fund as the you know, arrowhead of a movement to shift and change the narrative. And we, and we struggle to, um, to work with movements that are uh, fast growing, that move quickly, that are, uh, are quite rightly so uh, reactive because they are taking on issues as they come. That is a huge lift for bureaucratic organizations such as mine and many of the large philanthropists. I, I love what Hakima just said about black philanthropists because they are, um, I think they might be more uh, nimble than some of the older ones. And so maybe the, the, the community and the collective can, can begin to make space to have conversations about um, working differently uh, with uh, with black feminists uh, and especially with uh, with the black feminist movement. Yeah, that that's great. As you were talking, I was um, thinking about um, those um, billionaires who um, uh, think it more important and pressing to go flying off into space for twenty minutes. Yeah. than do other things that you could do with the same amount of money, but don't let's go there. Um, Tanisha, what, what, can you think of anything else or do you want to add to uh, those points that colleagues have made about the, the conduit community? I, I, I wanna, yeah, I wanna underline the, the resource mobilization um, that Hakima shared. And, and we, we don't look at support around fundraising as like, just this transactional thing, like 
when you move money, that's a part of a political project. And so we, we would love to invite the conduit community in the political project about resourcing um, and being in solidarity with Black feminist movements and then the Black philanthropy piece for sure. The only other thing um, uh, that I can think of is just around communications and press. You know, I think what we want to do is lift the visibility of Black feminist movements. So any support there, because we want to make sure that we're always centering the leadership of our movements and our communities. And as we grow our relationships, build our community, we love to be in partnership around raising the visibility around the power of their work. And then also for the fun, um, some of the, in the questions, the beautiful questions that were framed, we want to tell the story of Black feminism and the power of it and support, in the, and support using this conduit platform would be pretty incredible for us. That, that, that's really great. I think, um, and I'm sure amongst our members, there are people with um, uh, plenty of comms, uh, knowledge, and all the kinds of areas that, 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 that you'd find useful, that we'd find useful. Um, the other thing I'd, I'd like to think is that this isn't just a one-off. And, you know, as I say, after this, you know, you, we've sent out call for action and maybe some people respond and get a trickle of, of, of um, commitment, but, but let's make sure that this is something that we keep returning to. And hopefully each time we return to it, it will have advanced uh, some more. Um, I'm gonna do this thing now of looking at the Q and A and see what kinds of questions we got here. So, um, ah, yes, here's, here's a question that's been um, uh, asked quite a lot recently, which I take as a hopeful sign. So this is from Sarah Greenfield Clark, and she says she'd love to hear the panel's thoughts on increasing allyship as, as, a, as white women living in the UK, oh, sorry, as a white woman living in the UK, I want to be able to do more and instigate change in as many places as possible. Uh, thank you, and in solidarity. Who, who would like to have, have a go at that question? I'll jump in here. Um, and Sarah, thank you for the question. You know, I think, so I think I'm, I work in three, so I'll say three things in terms of what, um, how white women based in the UK can be in solidarity. I think that the first is, um, is solidarity, right? And I think solidarity takes multiple different forms. Solidarity does come in the form of resources. And the reality is a part of the challenge of racism and sexism is, is about the, the inequity on how resources flow. That's just real. And, and resources to often dictate how people can live their lives. And so resource solidarity is an opportunity where white allies can create circles. So I encourage you, Sarah, create a, create a, create a circle with your community of friends um, and other leaders and colleagues um, dare I say it, comrades, to give to the Black Feminist Fund and be in resource solidarity because you know that those resources will go to Black feminists and Black women leadership. The second is, is always on continuing to disrupt the ways in which those harmful practices of the ways in which um, anti-Blackness shows up because too often we talk about it in political spaces and that's not even supported. And then in personal spaces or in, in relationships at work or in community, those anti-Black pr practices are not always challenged. So I think it's always continuing to be in community to intervene, not just in the political and in the public spaces, but in the personal, in the intimate spaces, because that's actually where anti-Blackness gets justified in the big public realm. Um, and then I think the third is, is that continuing to do our study, Black feminisms, we're in political, study all the time. This is our project, our practice, it's our liberation. And we believe that your freedom there is tied up in all of ours. Like our, so no one's free without black freedom globally. Um, and so I think that the, the opportunity is we need study. And so I encourage you and your allyship to continue to study around how anti-blackness shows up and how to pursue and be committed to the liberation of black people. Um, and the first part is being in solidarity around resources. Thank you. Um, I think that that thing about um, increasing self-knowledge and knowledge about our histories for white people is really critical because, you know, in these moments post George Floyd's murder, there were any number of, of white folks who would say, well, you know, what's the history of this or, or what was Tulsa about or, or what happened here or what happened there? And then in our history here in, in Britain, 
actually, I think some people know more about the history of African Americans in America than they do about Black Britons in, in this country. So I think that's another area where why allies can 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 help support us here. Um, Hakima or, or Matoni, did you want to add anything to that about this idea of, of allyship and what white women can do? Um, Hakima saying no, you don't have to, because I've got some other questions here. Let me let me do some other questions because we can fit in a few more before we have to finish. Okay, so here's a question from Chanel De uh, Daniels, who asks, in your opinions, what should be the priority the high, of, of, of high impact activities that you and we should be involved in? I'm getting more and more impatient about the change that is needed. It's a heartfelt plea. What, what, would your, what are your priorities? What would yours be, Mutoni? If you were to start on, on, on this, well, not if you were to start on this, but your contrib in terms of your contribution to this project. I, I think, think you're on, yeah. Yeah, yes. Um, so uh, we, we are very excited about the fund because it, it fills uh, an important niche. Um, but uh, as, um, as Tanisha has just pointed out, uh, I think that one of the one of the first big steps is education, uh, and by education, um, yes, educating ourselves, etc. But all, but actually introducing uh, the introducing uh, the rationale behind the fund and the fund itself uh, into uh, into the networks that we work with, because uh, I, I have no doubt that the energy and the passion of the founders and the fund will, will take it far. But as, 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 uh, as uh, not, I'm not, the word is not sponsor, as, um, uh, as partners to the fund, uh, opening up your networks, and introducing and bringing the fund forward and educating people about the fund is really critical because it is via those networks that you then um, that that you then begin to uh, educate um, uh, people about the rationale behind the fund, but also what the fund does, the potential, and eventually, hopefully, that will bear fruit in giving the fund the energy that it needs to do its work, which is to get more money into its coffers. So I think large institutions can uh, you open up the, the networks by introducing uh, the fund uh, both to their own work, but also into their larger networks. I know that that is one of the ways uh, that uh, uh, our executive uh, director who is a champion of the fund has has talked about uh, the potential catalyst uh, cat cat the catalytic potential of this of the black feminist fund to support movements that right now are, are very poorly served thank you very much Hakima do you want to add any priorities or tell us what your your top three priorities are yeah and first can I absolutely sympath sympathize with Chanel. I am deeply impatient. And uh, I think in my 20s, they told me as I got older, it would get better. But I'm in my 40s now, and I still am deeply impatient <laughs> for this change. Um, and not only impatient, I'm also an optimist, which is a strange combination. So I see what's happening in the world. And I think, yes, maybe we're there. And so with with COVID and the pandemic, I see also how all of these issues are getting tied in. The, the movements and people, ordinary people, are seeing how this all relates and how the racial justice, the gender justice, the climate justice, all of these things are related and that we need to struggle together. And so I'm deeply optimistic that our movements are going to get to a place that is pivotal in the coming years. Um, and I would say there's, there's no one priority because, but the only priority is to take the leadership from the people who are most deeply impacted. And that that has to be the priority. If we can follow the leadership of those who are 
the most marginalized, the most deeply affected by the issues that we're trying to address, I think then we will win. Thank you. I'm going to, because I want to fit in a couple more questions before we leave. So I'm just going to just quickly go to the chat. Um, the, this is not a question, but, but perhaps um, uh, an amplification of this call to action for um, members of the conduit community from Patricia, Patricia Samz Samzahi. So I hope you're well, Patricia, um, who says that, um, you know, the statistics for development and philanthropy govern the world of enterprise funding too. It's really difficult um, uh, to get um, funding as a black woman for, for, uh, for venture capital. So whilst white women received 11% of venture capital over the past um, 10 years, black men received 0.24%, black women received only 0.02%. And so Patricia says this is an area where the conduit community can be more intentional, especially for black women creating remarkable social enterprises. So that, that's great. Um, let me just see, that looks like I've run through there. I'm just going to have a double check on the other questions. I think we've probably actually managed to, um, uh, to cover most of the points. Right, so here, oh, okay, here we go. Ah, ha ha. So um, somebody else that, that, that I'm very well aware of, Rocky uh, Shah, um, we would love to talk to you more at Black Feminist Fund. Here you go. Everything you're doing is amazing. Rocky is the, the CEO of the Circle NGO. I'm, I'm sure that some of you um, will know about the Circle. Do you know about the Circle? NG, the NGO that is absolutely for women, particularly those in disadvantaged and difficult situations. So there's a connection that, that, that we can make straight away. Um, we probably, there aren't any more questions in, in, oh, wait a minute. I've no sooner said there aren't any more questions than, yeah, I think I've answered all of those or we've answered all of those. Um, so any concluding uh, comments from, from all of you? Um, I must say it's been wonderful, but an all too short session. But is, is, is there anything else you'd, you'd like to say um, about the BFF and your hopes um, for it over the coming years? And perhaps if you could, because the thinking about the international aspect of it, can you perhaps sort of um, paint us a picture of, of where you think we, you might be, we might be in five to eight years? Um, if all goes according to plan. So what would that look like for us here, as well as for you there and, and people in, on the continent of Africa, et cetera? I think what you raise, Lola, around the, the global nature of the Black Feminist Fund is really important to lift up. Um, I think it's one of the only Black institutions and certainly Black feminist institutions that is global. Um, and the reason for that is, as we know, um, all of our struggles are really closely interlinked, but Black women face very similar situations, if not localized and differentiated locally, but at a very kind of systemic level, very similar. Um, and that addressing that there's a hunger amongst Black feminists to exchange and to learn and to connect with one another. And that's part of what we'll do as the Black Feminist Fund as well. So we're really excited that this is a, a global endeavor and to be working at that, at that level. So just in closing, I wanted to say thank you so much for having us. And as, as you were saying, um, I hope that this is the start of a conversation, not just for the Black Feminist Fund with all of you, but also um, for the conduit community around black feminisms and, and what we do. We'll definitely make sure that, that that's on the agenda again and again and again. Um, Tanisha, any closing remarks on that subject or anything else? Yeah, I think, you know, the five to 10 years from now, we're going to be able, we're going to catch a wind and the wind of winning. And so we're going to see to see structures and societies not completely transformed because it takes time, but mm -hmm. we're going to see that we are making real benchmarks and that's because Black feminist movements have been resourced well and the Black Feminist Fund played a role in that. We know that we won't be the vehicle 
to resource Black feminist movements around the world, all of them, because we need all the resources. But what we will do is model what solidarity looks like. So 10 years from now, we, we in partnership and community with other Black feminists from around the world and our allies that want to show up and support would have modeled what solidarity looks like around resources. And, now, and then 10 years from now, we are in a different conversation around money and Black women's leadership. It won't be a venting conversation. It'll just be a dreaming conversation for Black women. Excellent, thank you. And Mutoni, I'm going to give you the last word, the final words of wisdom. Yes, and um, I think the, the, the final word for me is a word that was used earlier, which is sustainability. I think that the Black Feminist Fund will be a, a catalyst, will uh, will seed probably other funds uh, and initiatives and, and drive uh, and be catalytic in driving systemic change, um, not just for black, uh, for, for black women's movement, but um, uh, around the world for, uh, for, for, for black, not for just for black organizations, but for black feminists around the world. And it's global. So it's whether they're in Brazil, or whether they're in the Caribbean, or whether they're in the Pacific. I, I think that in 20 years time, um, the Black Feminist Fund will be, uh, will, will, will be a seeding body that will create uh, other, uh, other entities uh, to do the, the local work that is needed. But I have every faith. That, that is a wonderful note on which to finish. So it just remains, uh, to me to thank thank all of you. It's been a wonderful conversation and I sincerely hope that we'll be in touch and at some point in this crazy world actually meet in person. That would be great. Yes. And um, you'll have to come to the UK Parliament to, um, what, what can I say? Well, to observe, <laughs> to be the anthropologist on Mars. That would be very interesting. But seriously, um, I, I wish you well, obviously. We'll keep in touch, I know. And we'll, we'll hold the conduit to um, having another of these conversations, but not in the same, I'm going to put it, not at the same point, but where we've moved on, we as the conduit in relation to our support. Um, so, um, yes, I've made some promises on other people's behalf, which is always a lovely thing to do. Uh, so, and but seriously, thanks to colleagues at the conduit for, for arranging this uh, session, which has been wonderful. And um, again, thank you for all of those who participated participated at the end of what I'm sure has been a long um, uh, working day. So thanks very much indeed. And thanks especially to Katie. Shout out for Katie. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs>